So um, I know this won't come as a surprise to any of you, but uh, typically the, the President's Council, we take turns doing these things, but this year they came as a group and said, well, since this is your last year, why don't we just make our slides and you do it? <laughs> That's not happening. <laughs> We've learned to work as a team, right? So to lead us off, Rob Eust. Is that for you or me? Is that for him leaving or me starting? You know, they, they had me lead off because I told them that I'm going to set the standard on how quick this thing goes. So y'all. You two right here. Take note. Over the break, we received information from our engineer on how we can remediate the structural issues in TPAC. So that is going to start here in the next couple of weeks. Um, we hope to have that finished by sometime next semester, but at the worst case scenario, at this time next year, we will be back in TPAC. So it may not be as crowded. <laughs> If you do not know, but most of you do know, that we have had a turnover in our CIO. Uh, Mr. Stadler has left to seek opportunities elsewhere, and we you know, encourage him to, to succeed and I hope he does well. We have put out the feelers, and we have over 80 applicants for that job right now. I checked this morning. And we have a very good, strong pool, so we feel that uh, we're going to start interviews in the next couple of weeks. We should have somebody on board within a month or so, but our IT staff currently is phenomenal. We will not skip a beat right at all. All these, all these guys right up here do a bang up job and they're gonna be great, so I'm not worried a bit. And finally, the last thing here, 119, does anybody know what that number represents? How old I feel. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. You're getting older by the minute, too, let me tell you. I know we just came back from the break, so I thought maybe you guys needed something to look forward to. 119 days until our four-day work week. And you know, it would have been 118, but you know, this is leap year, so we got another day, so... With that said, I am done. Look at that. Well, I know who you were applauding for that time, so. <laughs> well, good morning. I had the opportunity yesterday to travel to Jeff City and represent the university and Dr. Marble in front of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Education. These are seven members of the General Assembly that are charged with determining what budget is, is taken to the floor uh, for debate later in the session. So it was a great opportunity for every university to put for their top priorities. As you probably recall from our conversation in the spring, our number one legislative priority this year is to get the 1.8 million that was one-time funding last year into our core appropriation which means it will come back to us year after year after year. We won't have to go up there and fight about it every time. And so we presented them with that as our number one priority. We've used that money this year to renovate our cadaver lab, to expand the number of nurses we educate, to lay the groundwork for taking the dental hygiene program from a two-year to a four-year program. All the great STEM initiatives that you hear about happened because of that $1.8 million this year. We want to continue that momentum. And so we visited with them about that being our number one priority. That is a little bit of a challenge because every university could come up with their own two, three, four million dollar priority they wanted to see. But we have some great leadership from Southwest Missouri in the House Budget Committee. Cody Smith is the chairman, Lane Roberts and Dirk Deaton are both on the committee, and they have each committed that they understand that that's our number one priority and they're willing to work with the House Budget Committee to advance that as far as they can, hopefully all the way to the governor's desk for signature in May. So that was our number one priority. 
Our second priority was to acquire the Joplin Regional Center, where our Child Development Center is located now. Uh, we pay rent on that facility. We'd love to not have to pay rent. If we owned it, we would be able to stop that. Uh, we need to get the last few mental health employees to transition to a new location, and uh, the Department of Administration Secretary Steelman has been very supportive of our efforts to do that. We shared that with the, the Appropriations Committee. And then Dr. Carson, the folks in Academic Affairs have developed a new computer science curriculum, new program called the Spectrum Center. We are requesting $4 million in matching funds so that we can go out and raise $4 million uh, to make that program a reality at our downtown campus in uh, Joplin. And so those were, those were the three institutional priorities that uh, we shared with the Appropriations Committee yesterday. In addition, we are members of COFI, the Council of Public Higher Education in Missouri. And COFI has two initiatives that they are putting forward this year, and we're fully supportive of those because they benefit us. The first is, Appropriations are like a roller coaster. One year you, it's a plus, and the next year it's a minus, and then the next year it's a plus, and it's a minus. We would love to see some consistency in those appropriations. And the best way to frame that conversation with the legislature is to say, just give us the rate of inflation every single year. We're not going to ask for large increases, 10, 20 million dollars. Just give us the little bit every year consistently so that we can budget because our costs consistently increase every year because of inflation. So we shared this graph with them. The bottom line, the green line, shows what we actually receive. There's that roller coaster. The top line shows if in 2009, beginning in 2010, we had just received the inflationary increase. Add that up over the years, that's $57.5 million that we would have received that we didn't. So not only would we not have to ride the roller coaster, but we also would have a reliable source of inflationary increases to match the increases in costs we receive each year. They understood that, and I shared with them that there are four expenses that are completely out of our control that eat up over half of the appropriations, not our total budget, but the appropriations we receive every year. One is Mosher's, our required contribution to Mosher's. That has increased from 12.75% in 2007 to almost 22%. Now that's a 70% increase in a little over a decade. They don't call and ask. They don't consult us. They don't say, what do you think? Rob gets a letter every year that says, here's what you will pay to be a part of Mosher's, and that's taken right out of our budget. We have to make adjustments internally to meet that increase from Mosher's. The second of the four that eat up half of our appropriations is our health insurance. Now, going self-insured has helped mitigate that to a certain extent, but it's still an increase in cost based on inflation our utilities, and finally computer software and all the databases that I know the, the faculty and the students rely on uh, for the academic side of the house. Those are costs that are out of our control. And they eat up half of the 24 million that we get each year from the legislature. I think they were a little surprised to hear that. The second Kofi uh, priority is ongoing maintenance and repair. This is an, we're in a unique situation. Most campuses are over 100 years old. This campus was built from scratch in 1967. We're 50 years old, a little older. So for the first 50 years, it's like owning a home. Everything's good. The first 10 years you live there, nothing breaks. <laughs> Talk to Rob and Brian. Now everything breaks. We have $24 million in deferred maintenance backlog at this institution. $24 million in items that need to be addressed and they'll be less expensive to address them now than to wait until they break. I shared that with the legislature as well. So really, it was an opportunity for us to talk to them about our challenges and controlling expenses, uh, things that are out of our control, the way that a reliable source of appropriations uh, would be very helpful, and also to talk about how that 1.8 million would continue to advance our center of excellence in the health sciences. Thank you very much. And I always enjoyed uh, roller coaster rides, but apparently not. Thank you for ruining that for me. Um, so here we go. I'll be very brief as well, because I do believe in speed and beating Rob in anything. So a uh, few things, MIAA competitiveness. I just wanted to point out a few things as far as what's going on in the athletic fields. Uh, we had 10, MI 10 MIAA athletes of the week, which actually works out to be one every two weeks. Uh, there's 14 institutions uh, within the MIAA, so you can see that we do very well at the MIAA level. We had two national athletes of the week. Uh, we won cross country. We won the region, the NCAA regional cross country. Jamie Burnham, for the second year in a row, was the conference uh, coach of the year. 
And uh, Gideon Kumatai, which is, uh, he's from Kenya. Um, he is actually the second, also the runner, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, consecutive year uh, NCA Regional Athlete of the Year. So it's very exciting stuff we're, we're doing in, in this space. I talked to Dr. Marble about this and, and we went through some of the numbers. I, I thought it was appropriate for us. We have about five, little over 500 student athletes, little 530ths I guess. 25% of our student athletes have declared majors and are required to declare a major prior to the start of their junior year. So after four consecutive semesters, they have to have declared a major. Uh, they normally declare early on, but 25% of our student athletes are in the School of Business. 14% uh, are in Education. 14% are in Kinesiology. 11% are in sciences, and 8% are in health sciences. So that kind of gives you a breakdown. If you kind of throw the numbers so you can see what those numbers correlate to. I'm not sure if people always know if they're a student athlete or not when they're in their classrooms, but this is where they go. They go out into the workforce. Um, they go out into these different areas, and this is what they're studying. So I thought that'd be important for you to see kind of how the breakdown is of these majors. We do have 532 student athletes. The average GPA overall is 3.08 across the department. And the highest was uh, softball with a 3.527. Um, so that is, that's kind of where we stand overall. The importance of our academics is, that's, how we're, that's what we're here to do. Yes, we have probably about 20 professional athletes right now, but that's out of 500, that's not very many. Um, so they really have to go out there and get, and get real jobs when they graduate or go to graduate school. We have a couple in the med school here in Joplin uh, right now as well. So we have a 3.08 GPA overall, which we're very proud of that, for the, especially with 532 student athletes. A couple other slides, I'm just gonna talk about some things we do in the community. Last year we, Overall, departmentally, student athletes being the, the bulk of that, did 5,500 hours of community engagement in the local activities. Uh, they did a Foxbury Terrace Senior Living for, uh, they sang, believe it or not, they actually can, some of them are pretty good singers. Uh, me not in included, but, uh, and decorated cookies uh, with the scene at the Senior Living Center. Trick or treats so others can eat, I don't know if you saw that, it always gets news coverage. But they go around the local communities and uh, they collect canned goods and they brought in 6,000 canned, a little over 6,000 canned goods, which actually fills Souls Harbor until March. So we're the biggest con uh, contributor to Souls Harbor over that event. Um, and so you may have seen some, if you depends where you live, but I know, uh, Dr. Carson had, I think it was women's cross country, went through her neighborhood and she had a, they, had, they just had done really well, so she had a sign up there for them when they came by and they kept it, they stole it from you. So we're very proud of them. <laughs> I, I took a picture of it because they had it in their office. I'm like, I don't think you're supposed to take that. I'm like, oh, I, she said. And so, um, and then baseball works with Special Olympic Bowling. Men's basketball has been reading at schools, especially in the off season. Softball's been volunteering at several schools and churches. And football really starts now this time of the year. Every Saturday they do community engagement on Saturdays uh, in the local community. A lot of times working on parks, fixing, fixing things, Ronald McDonald House or whatever. They do a lot of, a lot of work around there for that. We have a Student Athlete Advisory Council, which is basically a student athlete led group. Their responsibility is to serve as leaders for the student athletes and work with administration on the needs or requirements. It's a mandated NCAA um, activity group. And so a few things that they've stepped up and done this year, they actually do the trick or treat so others can eat. That's one of their activities that they put together. If you've been to any of our basketball games, they've done two of them so far. It's called the Miracle Minute. In one minute, they're all up in the stands. They pass some buckets and just collect spare change. Um, and that money goes to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. In just two dates, they've generated over $1,000 uh, for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And finally, we have a student athlete talent show. And if you're curious, these are some of our Samoans doing their war dance, which is very scary. But. Uh, but they were actually, that was part, that was one of the things in the student athlete uh, talent show. And we have some very talented athletes uh, singing and dancing and, and even that aggressive stuff. Um, part of that also, if, you're, if you are curious to know, we did send um, a couple of uh, people over to Samoa over the holidays to do some recruiting. Um, so we'll get some reports on that. But with the way we have now with the tuition being in state from Hawaii and the Pacific Islands, it's been, it'll be a great thing for us to bring in uh, more diversity to the campus. And so it's very, we're very excited about that. With that, that concludes uh, my presentation. So thank you very much.
Good morning. Welcome back. We're all still asleep, right? <laughs> Dr. Marvel told us about eight different times, please be brief. And so some of us took that to heart. And so uh, <laughs> thank you, Rob. Uh, and Rob was cheery this morning. I think Rob needs a round of applause for that. That's <laughs> We have just a few brief slides. Some of the things that, that I want to bring to you today, you'll be seeing more information coming out through uh, email and, and through uh, the MOSO Minute and things, but I wanted to put on your radar the term MOSO Cares. Um, if you've been on campus for a while, you know Missouri Southern has a what we call the behavioral intervention team. Uh, after the Virginia Tech incidents, most campuses nationwide went to a, a behavioral intervention team, and that was really for students that were experiencing some sort of uh, different behavior, uh, odd behavior, disturbing behavior, and those type of things. And for years, Missouri Southern, we've had that group on campus. Um, we were proud to host, and you heard me talk about it in the fall, uh, behavioral intervention team national training uh, last May, and uh, we had 11 Missouri Southern uh, faculty and staff attend that and get nationally certified. And the focus of our group really changed to an all-encompassing. Uh, you know, we, we will still look at if you have a student that really is, is experiencing some difficulties or has some behaviors outside the norm, we will still deal with that. But what we found was that we need to really be bringing in from all different parts of campus students that are just experiencing crisis. Uh, we have students that, you know, have lost housing, students that have lost loved ones, students that are just experiencing severe anxiety here at the university, students that have never had to study in high school. It's amazing how many students we get that say, I never had to study in high school and, and I was a good student and now I'm struggling. And so, we have a group that meets every week uh, to talk about students that have been recommended by faculty and staff as needing some sort of, of resource or assistance. And so I just want to put those names out in front of you. And again, this is the group that meets regularly. Every week there's someone else that, that comes in that gives us expertise or, or an area that we have questions on. Uh, but just wanted to get the name of these folks out in front of you. We use the Lion Alert system, and so again, we encourage you to use the Lion Alert system, and you'll be getting more information, like I said, about the MOSO Cares as we go through the semester. But we just want you to know that there is a group that is working with our students to try to give them coordinated assistance when they have times of need or, or when they're struggling. So we greatly appreciate the team members, and I know many of them are here this morning, so thank you. I'm probably standing in front of the, the screen, so I should move around. Uh, Lion Village, we've talked about the, the new facility, um, and so this is uh, a fairly close rendering of what the new facility will look like. This will be a 305 person residence hall. It'll be a combination of traditional uh, rooms and suite style. Um, and I do want to remind you that this facility, this will be about a $20 million project and then we'll have about a $3 million uh, budget to do some renovations to the current facilities over there. This facility and those renovations, that total $23 million, will not come from the tuition dollars or appropriations. These are all, this is bonded, so it's similar to taking out a home loan. Um, this will be bonded for 30 years and we use the money that the students pay to live in the facility to pay off the facility. So no regular university budget dollars will go toward this project. This will all be supported by the fees that the students will pay for living in those facilities. So we wanted to, to give you a look of, of this facility. I think it's gonna be a, a great addition to the residence hall complex and to the campus as a whole. We'll have uh, study rooms, uh, we'll have a meeting room, and actually we'll have a uh, small area that will be able to be used by our Student Success Center for tutoring, group meetings, and different things like that. So there'll be a few different things that we don't currently have in our residence halls for our students. So we're excited about this. Construction is underway. If you look on that side of campus, it's directly north between the current residence halls and Royal Orleans. Um, and we are shooting for fall 21 occupancy for this facility. Wanted to update you on the Presidential Search Advisory Committee. Um, I serve as a member on that committee as well as your campus representatives there. Uh, Dr. Nicoletti, uh, Dr. Mauser, and Stephen Brunson. We represent their university 
on that committee with about uh, 10 other individuals, including four Board of Governors members. Um, there was a meeting this past week of that committee. Uh, the committee hopes to have the search firm to the Board of Governors for a recommendation uh, for next week's Board of Governors meeting. And so that process is up and running. Um, as that committee goes along, we'll try to keep you in, as involved as we can and let you know what's going on. Many of the things are confidential and we won't be able to tell you how many candidates, who the candidates are, those type of things. But we know that that's a process that many of you are, are definitely uh, inquiring about and want to be involved in it or at least know what the schedule is for that. So we'll do our best as, as your representatives to keep you in the loop of, of what's going on. A reminder, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Day celebration. Many of you, if you've been on campus, you know historically we've done a breakfast. The Diversity and Inclusion Committee this year has taken a different approach in an attempt to get more participation and to, and to get uh, a wider variety of participation. They have changed the format of this event. Uh, we, we've gone to an evening uh, style event. There will be some hors d'oeuvres starting at 6 o'clock um, and I think we have uh, musical entertainment by Kufara and so we'll definitely if that's a favorite of the campus. Um, Nimrod Chapel, who is the president of the Missouri NAACP will be our guest speaker um, and it, the facility will not be in Billingsley, it will be in the North End Zone facility. So we encourage you to come out and support this evening event. It's a seven o'clock uh, event in the evening versus a breakfast. And so we know many times that's difficult. We know we're dealing with weather usually on, on uh, this, this time of the year that early in the morning. And so we thought an evening event would work better. So thank you to the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for that. And we'd like to encourage you to come out for that. One thing that's not on my slides, and I know they hate this one because I, I divert almost every time. If you remember in the fall, I put some pictures up here and talked about some of the things our staff were doing. Well, we had something come up recently. Most of you know the non-academic side's equivalent of program review. Uh, we work through the Council for the Advancement of Standards in Higher Education. And so it's similar to program review and we do assessments and then they're reviewed and we're on a four-year cycle with, with our groups. And I want to say Cheryl Dobson, I don't know if Cheryl's in the room, our registrar, I know she had students in her office this morning, but I want to brag on Cheryl. She was selected nationally uh, to represent not only Missouri Southern, but the state of Missouri and ACRO, which is the Association for Registrars, uh, to rewrite some of the standards for the Council for the Advancement of Standards program review for registrar's offices nationwide. And so I just want to let you know so our folks are doing some things that are, that are very noteworthy. Uh, she served on that committee with someone from Stanford, someone from Harvard. Um, we did have a couple Missouri representatives on there, but uh, good company to be in. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that for Cheryl and say congratulations to her. And with that, I would bring up Dr. Carson. Thank you. Okay, just to be perfectly clear, I was not one of the president's council members who didn't want to talk. So, no surprise. So we got the, between Robbie and Cherry, the succulents up here and this being Alan's last meeting, uh, it's like a little twilight zone-ish for me. So uh, I just wanted to talk about a, a couple of things, primarily the strategic plan. So I guess I've been talking about this for a couple of years now, but I'm really excited at the point where we are, which is technically the point at which we are supposed to be, which almost never really happens in life. So um, just uh, a quick review for you. Just a moment before campus closed, I sent out to you guys a really large Excel matrix. I would have sent out uh, another format, a PDF or whatever, but I wanted you guys to be able to manipulate it in the way you wanted. Again, one of the advantages of sharing everyone's um, action plans for a strategic goal 1A, as well as a selection of the other strategic goals, was that you could look at what others were doing and see if you could possibly collaborate or create synergies in, um, in those particular areas. And so it's a fully accessible Excel sheet to you all. We are going to be presenting that at the Board of Governors meeting that is upcoming on um, January 16th. In May, and in a few months at the end of the semester, we're basically going to send that sheet back out to you all with additional inserted columns and ask you guys for a follow-up. I'll show you that in just a second. 
So in summary, this is what we did. This is what you, you received, a large Excel. Everybody's unit is represented. I know a lot of you have been working on that, and you tweak it, and you realize, well, maybe I want to switch, and that's fine. I want to ensure that you know that it's a dynamic document. It's supposed to be a helpful, guiding, planning, useful document. And so if you want to change things, and I know there's some departments that still, final is never really final. And I will be glad to make those changes as you see important on that particular document. But this is what we sent out so far. This is a document that we'll be sharing with the Board of Governors. And then in May, I will send that back out, and whoever your designated liaison is, and each of the goals, each of the four goals each unit identified does have a liaison, I'll be sending that back out to you guys with an additional column inserted that basically asks you to provide some narrative about how to go. Are you making progress on this goal? Do you still plan to pursue this goal? What are the challenges? And that'll really help us to understand what the barriers or impediments are to you reaching those goals. Maybe we can work collaboratively to remove some of those. So this will complete the, the cycle of year one for our action plan and goals. And then in August of 2020, we will start all over again. Um, again, you'll be able to say, yeah, we're making good progress on this goal, but it's not accomplished. We want to continue. You will be able to select as a unit other goals. You will be able to say, OK, we really now know that we, we represented ourselves as one unit, but we really have two different subgroups in here, and they want to pursue their own goals. And so you'll have a lot of flexibility just to begin. And we will uh, repeat that process for the entire five years of the strategic plan. I want to say that you guys have done awesome on this whole process. We used a very unique, different approach. We wanted it to not be burdensome, but to be very inclusive and transparent. And you guys have been enormously responsive, enormously reflective on this. And I think this is a plan about which we can be really, really proud collectively. There are a few other things I want to share with you. We talked about these in more detail at Academic Affairs yesterday, um, so I'll go through them pretty quickly. But these are the things that we'll be pursuing this semester and probably this entire calendar year. The first is growing our concurrent enrollment program, which is an umbrella term for dual credit or dual enrollment of variety. Perhaps you saw we had really, really good media coverage, um, and uh, Brett Meeker and Martha Freeman, who really head up this initiative in that office, have done a whole lot of work in reaching out and growing this. But what we realized is that Many of the students in concurrent enrollment in our dual credit classes here on campus and at the high schools are really the ones who have, in, in large part, the financial means and the family support to be able to do that. We have very reduced tuition for dual credit students, for high school students in our college classes, only $50 a credit hour. But we realized even that $150 was a significant economic barrier to many students. And so we have announced a program, and we will be sharing this with the governors as well, the 16th called On the Move. And our On the Move program basically allows, with our partner school districts, students who are on reduced or free lunch schedules to be able to take dual credit classes for free with us. It's not going <laughs> to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I should add this. I'm very appreciative for the support of the President's Council to be able to, to do this. And I think this will make a world of difference for our region. Um, if students, while they're still in high school, who never had an aspiration or a family history of going to college are able to say, yeah, I can do this and I can be successful, and it gives them that self-efficacy to continue, hopefully here, but wherever, I think we'll just be, be doing a very good thing to contribute to the betterment of our society. So very excited about that. Economically, it will not hinder us. We pay our dual credit faculty on a sliding scale based on the number of students anyway, and so we think this will be a very, very very valuable recruiting tool. We think this will be a cost beneficial program for us, but mostly we think that we will end up meeting our basic core mission of educating more students. The second thing that we are um, still continuing to pursue, and you can imagine a collaborative partnership like this um, takes a while. We've been working on it for several months, but that is a, a program where we would very much like to allow students in the Joplin and the Southwest Missouri region to be able to pursue an engineering degree. 
for many years as we've talked to employers and looked at our industrial diversity, we know that it really is industrial engineering that is the highest specific engineering discipline that is in demand in our particular area. No one offers it in this area. There is between MST and Missouri State and Springfield a collaboration where they offer other engineering disciplines, mechanical, civil and the like, but nobody in this region is doing industrial. We would like for our students to be able to pursue an industrial engineering degree without having to travel to Mizzou. So we are working with Mizzou, the main campus in Columbia, to see what we might be able to do on this, on this front. Um, where we have progressed to so far is a degree program, and of course, we're cognizant of the need to keep it as close to 120 as possible, but even just a singular engineering degree cannot be accomplished in 120 hours. So we're trying to be very efficient with the utilization of the student credit hours, but basically what we are looking right now now is that students will come and attend on this campus and they will actually receive from Missouri Southern an applied math degree, which is a degree that we are already um, allowed to offer, and that they would receive a second degree simultaneously from Mizzou in industrial engineering. We are hoping we are working to be able to offer all four years on this campus um, doing some very innovative things like uh, compressed scheduling or actually having Mizzou faculty in residents on our campus, but we think that will be a, a very, very good opportunity and that will really help us to meet a lot of employer demands. So we're continuing to work on that. As you know, with any institutional effort in higher ed, there are a lot of barriers to overcome. We do something like this that is really innovative and different. But I, I do want to thank um, those who have worked on it. I'd like to thank the math department for coming up with a really innovative way that a student could graduate with two degrees. And our initial reconnaissance on this suggests that employers are very, very excited about the possibility of this combination of degrees, an industrial engineering degree as well as an applied math degree. We are continuing, um, I, I don't know, it's sort of a revisiting of our program that I, I stood on a stage somewhere on this campus in Taylor probably and talked about for a couple of years. That's our Universal Transfer Opportunity Program. It is a program that is oriented not toward traditional students but really toward those who have already completed an associate's degree of some form at another institution or for those who have done so years ago and want to return to um, get a four-year degree so that they can move up in their companies or start their own businesses. And so it's an innovative program that allows us to build a special very um, lockstep curriculum for students so that they can complete a bachelor's degree in 120 years. I know the rhetoric is not new to anyone that <laughs> Again, just to see if you're listening. <laughs> 120 years. Oh, just about the time I'll retire. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And 100, 120 hours, and it won't be confusing. Many of the faculty have worked on this program over the past few years. Um, and so what we don't want is students with associate degrees thinking, well, I can come here and finish a degree in two years, and they look at the pre requisites and the required sequencing and it's another three and a half years before they can get one. So it'll be a very unique degree. It will be the Bachelor of Applied Science. We are already authorized to offer that degree. Your students will not be able to opt into that degree path. It will be very, very specific. But we think that this will be very beneficial to adult degree completion. We think a lot of Southwest Missouri students will be able to continue to a four-year degree in just over a century. And, <laughs> uh, and so we're very excited about that. And then finally, I wanted to talk about a couple of accreditations. These are newer ones that we are pursuing. I have spoken to you before about our music department um, pursuing NASM. Keith Talley has just been um, completely awesome and dedicated with his team and music to pursue this. We had the visit. The visit indicated that there were some issues with acoustical installation. Just before the holidays, we received a report from a very reputable consulting firm about what we could do to mitigate that. We will look at that, but we are very well positioned to achieve that. Simultaneously, the Department of Theater is looking at that companion um, certification, and, and that is NAST, where M is for music and T is for theater. So that would give us a really great recruiting advantage. These accreditations are very selective. 
they are very premier. Um, not a lot of schools actually are able to attain those, so it's part of our historical and our current strategic mission to achieve these accreditations when possible. I'm very excited that the faculty is, is willing to do that because it's, it's an enormous undertaking, a lot of burden of work. Um, and the new healthcare program in the Gibson Center has already begun the process of investigating accreditation for that program. Again, as you know, it's growing by leaps and bounds, well beyond our expectations, and it is one, again, which will be very differentiated if we can achieve this accreditation. And we're making very good progress in the School of Business on achieving double A. We have single A accreditation right now, but we have made enormous strides, and I thank the faculty very much in the School of Business for, for doing the really heavy lifting that it's taken to get us down this road um, under the leadership of, of Dean Zimmerman. It's really great accomplishment. We're really great progress. We're on a very, very good trajectory. So I thank all our faculty for these. These accreditations really allow us um, to stand different and stand apart from other institutions, and they're really, really helpful. So, so now I'm going to do my off-slide talks like Darren. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I just have really, I just have really one comment. Perhaps this is the last time that um, I will have the privilege to share this stage with Dr. Marble, and I, I just want to say, it, it's been a privilege. <laughs> I'm sorry. Didn't they all do a great job? Give them a round of applause. Much better than I would have done when you tried and it didn't work out. Um, it is the last time, and uh, it's uh, kind of surreal, frankly. Um, Ken Dobbins, some of you know Ken, he was president at CMO for many years. And um, when I announced my retirement, he called and he said, that, um, he, he said, watch out for the la first last time and the next last times and the last times. It, it didn't really uh, impact me too much until I had a first last time. And a uh, football homecoming came. And that was the first last time. And this is the last time I'll have all of you together to talk. So um, I gave it some uh, serious thought about what to, to, to um, try to talk to you about today. So we'll get to that in a moment, but I have a few tasky things to um, take care of first. I wanted to make sure that you know who. Yeah, my head's in that thing. Let me move over. Too tall. <laughs> Should have wore shorter, shorter shoes. Um, we had two replacements on the board this year. I think you're probably aware of it. Uh, Ron Richard and Marianne Morgan were added because Tracy Flanagan's term expired. And um, Mike Franks decided that he wanted to be a full-time retiree after spending a couple months in Michigan. He liked it a lot. Um, and Florida even more. So uh, he, they resigned. We, we do have uh, replacements. It's they're both very good. I don't know if you know, I did not know Marianne Morgan at all that we'd never met. She's a very bright attorney in Carthage. Uh, of course, Ron Richard is a guy that the, has known the governor for years, so that's very helpful for us. The governor refers to him as Ronnie, so that's a good thing for us to have going for us. Uh, not up here, but also important, I think, for you to know, and you probably do, is that former Senator Gary Nodler is now on the coordinating board. And before Senator Richard left office, he helped get that accomplished. And that's going to be good for our university going forward. And I did have some board assignments this year. I think I spoke to that earlier uh, in one of our meetings, because uh, they didn't want me sitting around for this last year doing nothing, I guess. Um, the strategic plan, which you just heard from Dr. Carson, we're going to take care of. Actually, uh, next week, there'll be a report to the board. Uh, succession planning, they wanted to know what happens if, you know, Rob gets hit by a car. Or a bus. <laughs> so uh, we did work together and figured out sort of some succession planning down two or three levels. But that's been submitted to the board confidentially uh, because things change, you know, over time. And we don't want anyone cutting anyone's brake lines. So they move up. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the 1.8 million that uh, Dr. Hodson talked about, that's uh, certainly something that we're going to work on. We do have strong support in the House. I think that we're in, we're in very good shape uh, besides Cody that you spoke of. And then there are local people. We do have Elijah Hart, Speaker of the House in Springfield, uh, very supportive. 
Uh, we do have some help in the Senate um, with Mark Elliott and Dan Hageman, who uh, they are old friends, um, in fact, roomed together years ago in the House when they both were elected. And then the governor, of course, we have some access with uh, Ron Richard, or Ron, as he likes to be called. Well, as I thought about what really to talk about, not to get to it, um, anyone read this book? This, you know, 10 years old or so? Oh my gosh. You got to get out more. <laughs> um, this uh, book was, the last lecture was written by Randy Pausch. He is a uh, professor at Carnegie Mellon University and um, had cancer. He was going to die. And, um, but he wanted to make one last lecture. And he wanted to make the lecture to his colleagues. And so he worked on this lecture and then he wrote a book and it's a very, very good book. Uh, so that's kind of where I want to go today is a little bit with the last lecture, except for two things. I don't want to die. <laughs> and I don't want it to be too much of a lecture, but it's kind of funny how things go full circle. Because uh, my first talk to this group was in this room. It was in Corley. And you know, we've moved this around now. We've been in uh, Taylor, we've been uh, LMP, but um, due to circumstances, we're back here today. So it's, it's kind of a, a full circle um, trip for me. And um, that's kind of what I want to focus on. I want to go back to the first talk that I had with this group. Um, actually, it wasn't this whole group. It was just the faculty. Uh, because in those days, we didn't have faculty and staff. Remember, it was just faculty that came to these meetings. So, so I have a quick question. How many of you were here in August, like the second week of August 2013? Raise your hand. Several of you, OK? And several were not. So um, since there are so many that were not, let me just kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, I'd been hired as interim president, and um, I, I, I really don't have to describe the, the campus was in a little bit of turmoil. <laughs> Is that fair? Those of you who raise your hand, that's fair. Um, we had uh, some board members who felt that we would never hire another tenured faculty person ever. That was public. Um, that we were going to outsource every job that mechanical maintenance and other people did. And a few other ideas that were probably um, causing, I mean, reasonable concern, right? <laughs> so. Um, I asked one of my longtime friends who's on the faculty here, I won't name, uh, what he thought my job was. He said, well, it's just to put fun back in dysfunction because that's what we are. <laughs> and uh, I really um, didn't know exactly you know, where to turn except I had between July 1st and then the second week of August to get around and meet people. And what I really thought needed to happen was not tasky kind of things, but to change our attitude and change kind of our culture of how we we operate and to just learn to trust each other more and not work adversarially. And so I found the old, well, it had to be scripted in those days, by the way, um, because Joanne Grafham, who remembers Joanne? She was here, and Cassie, you know, um, they were very particular about scripting because they'd had trouble before with other people getting off script and getting <laughs> in trouble. And so I was scripted. And I still have it. I couldn't find the PowerPoint that I used, so I developed another similar one. But here's what I said uh, almost seven years ago, um, interrupted by a few uh, comments I'll make. I said, it's a great honor to be here today. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to visit with you for a few minutes. It's especially meaningful for me because I'm a proud graduate of this institution and the opportunity to speak to faculty and staff is very gratifying. I put staff in there because you weren't here. <laughs> <clears throat> we have th several things on our plate that I could spend time talking about today. Like state budget withholdings, that never changes. Performance funding issues, still here. Kofi's new funding formula, now we're calling true up, we're trying to do it. Or program prioritization, ooh, who remembers program prioritization? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> Well, we slowed that down a little bit. But what I really want to talk to you about, and I do again today, I want to talk to you about something that's much more important than those things. It's the most important thing I can think of. It's you, the faculty and staff, and the unique positions you hold. What I want the spotlight for you is that you're involved in a remarkable field of work. 
that you need to believe that this is some of the most important work on the planet. Frankly, the, um, the future of our community, our nation, and uh, the world really relies on education. Nelson Mandela said it very well. That education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. And folks, we live in a world that needs to be changed. That, that was true seven years ago and maybe more true today than ever. So you should know that I, I believe in the work you, you do that ranks very high. Somewhere between medical doctor and priesthood. Anybody remember me saying that? I think it's about it. <laughs> Actually, no. seven years later, yeah, above. Some people think that statement's too brash because doctors save lives. But you help young people build lives worth living. And that's a very special calling. And I'd like to tell a story about a magician. I hope you find it humorous and maybe meaningful. So there's a magician that worked at this nightclub, same nightclub for years and years. And performing the same tricks night after night until finally he became completely disenchanted. And uh, after a set where he was booed off stage, he ended up in the dressing room and vowed that he wouldn't come out until he created the master trick to end all tricks. But amazingly, the trick came to him like a bolt out of the blue. He had all the ingredients, had a great setup, volunteer from the audience, and a great zinger of an ending. Plus he had all the props he needed right there in the dressing room with him. He had a small table and a sledgehammer. So he dashed out of the dressing room with a hammer in one hand, table in the other, jumped back on stage and asked for a volunteer. Grabbed a lady from the front row and explained to her that all she had to do was take the sledgehammer and smash him in the temple as his lady said on the table. And then, no, she protested, I can't do that. You might be killed. So I'm a professional. Everything will be fine. So reluctantly, she raised the hammer. He put his head on the table. She smashed it down on his unprotected skull. Of course, the magician was immediately not unconscious. Ambulance called. Paramedics took him to the hospital where he lay semi-comatose for about two weeks. When suddenly he opened his eyes, looked at the doctors and nurses standing around his bed and said, ta-da. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know that's a silly story, but <laughs> it does underscore the fact that quick fixes don't usually work and they don't get the job done. <clears throat> and even if they do appear to work, someone always gets hurt and there'll be pain. So when we approach these issues like program prioritization, state withholdings, campus budgeting, I think we need to take a patient, <coughs> deliberate, and open approach. And I think that's what we've tried to do. But as much as I don't believe in trickery or deception, I do believe there is magic. There's a special kind of magic. It's magic you can believe in. Like the magic of a newborn baby, the beauty of a rainbow, an afternoon in the mountains, or any of a million sunsets, or the magic that happens in your classrooms. When you see that light of learning pop over, open over a student's head, you can see it's magic, and you can believe in it. I know it happens, and it happens right here at Missouri Southern because it happened to me. And fortunately for me, two of my former professors are still working here, Terry Mary and Conrad Gebert, and that's true seven years later. Oh, it's out. Are either one of them here? Conrad's here, give him a round of applause. So back in the seven years ago, and not to embarrass either one of them, but I may never get another chance to recognize them, which I did actually get another chance to recognize them. <laughs> I said give them a round of applause, but I don't mind embarrassing them now, Conrad. <laughs> so the question now becomes, how can we maximize our ability to create that magic? Many would say it takes great leadership, and I tend to agree, but I define leadership differently. Um, and I think Lao Tzu had it right the Chinese philosopher, when he said, a leader is best when people barely know he exists. And when the work is done, the aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. But how we actually accomplish it involves a couple of other concepts. 
self-organizing systems, and servant leadership. Self-organizing systems for empowered people, empowered people, naturally lead and naturally follow. And then a piece from servant leadership that recognizes that at different times you'll be called on to be a leader and to be a supportive follower. So let me demonstrate. Just a moment ago, I asked you to give a round of applause to my good friend Conrad. Um, and you did so, naturally, without any help or instruction. As expected, it was random, asynchronous clapping of hands. But I wonder if we tried, could we clap together in unison? in synchronous, rhythmic manner. Somebody start us off. Thank you very much. See how easy that is. Now, who is the leader? We don't know. Maybe somebody you know, kind of back here. I'm not, not sure. And who are you following? You weren't following me, I didn't clap at all. You're following someone else. Was it the person beside you, the person behind you? Not exactly certain who you were following, but you weren't following who typically you would call the leader. So it's sort of a remarkable phenomenon that happens, that we have this tendency to want to self-organize and work together if we just let it happen. So to further emphasize that point, let me show you a brief little video that some of you will remember. Uh, some of you have seen before. It's not new, but it's self-explanatory. Self if you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I should stop at some point. There we go. <laughs> so, um, what did we learn? Traditional leadership is over glorified, in my view. And um, 
you know, we teach it, we preach it, we write books about it. We fail to recognize the vital role and most vital of followers, especially the first follower and the second follower, because they become the new leaders. And I think that's what we've learned over time here is that that happens. That um, it doesn't have to be to me. I don't have to be the crazy shirtless dancing guy all the time, but I kind of like doing it. Um, but when ideas pop up, like the co-op, right? That's, that's not a normal kind of thing, but it happened, and people fell in behind it and made it really work. So, yeah, I think we know that this works. And at the time, I said, simply, I believe the most important role that I have will be to create a safe and inviting, inviting environment where you can accept the risk of being the dancing guy when you have a great idea. And then I need to rush in as your first follower. I think as you look for the next president, make sure it's someone that gives you a safe and abiding environment. And I've probably used the word believe a dozen times or more in this little talk, and that's not accidental, because I think when we boil it all down, that's the place we need to focus. Because as Hodgson, Hodgson reminds us, some things have to be believed to be seen. It'll play on words, but very powerful. We need to believe in ourselves. We need to believe in our work. And we need to believe that our best days are ahead. I said that seven years ago, and I believe it now. Students need to believe that in their potential, <coughs> excuse me, and their futures, and our patrons and supporters, they need to believe too. But you know what they need to believe most? They need to believe that we believe. So now, you're probably wondering what this crazy dancing guy wants us to do next. Well, it's really pretty simple. I want you to fully appreciate the work you do. You remember medical doctor priesthood? Understand the synergies and the cooperation that happen naturally, like the rhythmic hand clapping. And embrace the fact that sometimes you will need to be a leader, and sometimes you need to be a supportive follower. But most of all, and in conclusion, I would simply ask that you continue to create the type of magic we can all believe in, campus-wide and in your classrooms every day. And I want you to know, without a shadow of a doubt, I believe in you with all my heart. That's the way it started seven years ago. And that's the way it should end, because I still believe in you, and I always will. I've watched you self-organize, become leaders, and at the time, supporting followers. And just to underscore this point, please stand up if you're a faculty senate officer, or have been, stand up. If you're a staff senate officer, or have been, stand up. Empowerment you folks, stand up. You had something to do with the great game, stand up. Every administrative assistant in this room, stand up. If you're part of mechanical maintenance, custodial, ground support staff, financial aid, stand up. President's cabinet. Assistant VPs, assistant AD, stand up. Look around. Deans, department chairs. If you've led a study abroad group, stand up. Directors, supervisors, managers, stand up. Coaching staff, athletic group, stand up. If you were a chair or part of the leadership team of any academic committee, we have a ton of them, stand up. If you served on those committees, stand up. If you're a part of an administrative committee, stand up. If you participated in the Southern Summit, get to your feet. Southern Welcome, stand up. Strategic planning sessions, if you participated, stand up. HLC preparation, stand up. And if you're not already standing, well, everybody is. <laughs> Look around. Look around. Everybody give yourselves a round of applause because you've done exactly what you're doing. Thank you very much. 
So now, as I end my version of the last lecture, I want to thank each of you, really from the bottom of my heart, for taking me in to the, me and my family, into the Lion family. You know, I, when my mother died, you started a scholarship. When Lori had brain surgery, she bravely turned it into the earrings and you sent her hundreds. And you celebrated Poppy with me. <laughs> and words just failed to let you know how much I appreciate you all. So, now as I leave, I hope um, my departure is not considered the end of anything in Missouri Southern, because I'm still convinced that our best days are ahead. I think that we would be well served to look at it as Churchill did after the British forces routed Rommel in North Africa during World War II. Well, this is not the end, and it's not the beginning of the end. Perhaps it is the end of the beginning. Welcome back. Have a great semester, and it's always a great day to be alive. Thank you all very much.